Hey guys, DJ Switch here from DangerousKids.net and Radio Free Nerdcore. I want to thank everybody involved with making this panel happen. First and foremost, of course, are my panelists. Angela from The Double Clicks, Adam Warrock, Kyle from Kirby Crackle, and of course, all of the PDX broadsides. Christian, Jess, and Holly. And I also want to thank my friend Adam the Alien for shooting this whole thing on the video camera so we could put it up on the YouTube. Uh, oh, and last but not least, I want to thank Mikey Nielsen from Chronicles of the Nerds and from Rose City Comic Con for scheduling me to host the panel. And it was just uh, an immense success, and I was super excited from beginning to end, and I'm still excited, which is why I'm going to put the video out of the entire thing. So here it is, and I hope you enjoy, and please don't forget to check out Chronicles of the Nerds and Adam the Alien, and of course my website, uh, DangerousKids.net, and my show, Radio Free Nerdcore. Uh, bye. Um, look at all the nerds, guys. <laughs> uh, what's up, everybody? My name is DJ Switch. I host a local podcast called Radio Free Nerdcore, and I'm all about dangerous kids. And, uh, uh, of course, we're here to talk about the former uh, Radio Free Nerdcore, a uh, specifically nerd music show uh, that I host right here in Portland. And um, all of the folks to my left have all been on that show as of this week. Yay! Uh, so I'm really excited to introduce these folks as my friends. First, on my immediate left, the lovely Miss Angela from the Double Clicks. Woo! Uh, who performed very recently, uh, like 2 o'clock this afternoon, so, um, I don't know, are you, are you good to go? Are you sleepy? I'm ready. Ready? Awesome. A warrior, this one. Uh, Alright, uh, and then after Angela, we have Mr. Adam Warrock. One of the things we have I have described Adam Warrock very publicly as a crazy person. And the reason why is because the last time I booked him for a show here in Portland, it was one of 10 stops in 11 days. I am the most tour. appropriate guest for the Nerd Rock panel. Yes. Because I <laughs> don't make rock. <laughs> I, I don't know how this panel got labeled Nerd Rock. It's, nerd music, I think, is more appropriate. Uh, Adam's here to represent the hip hop folks. Um, because he's extremely qualified and we're lucky to have him. So uh, give him one more time. Have a walk. Woo! Uh, I was just laughing. Uh, and from absolutely no nerd rock to the epitome of nerd rock, ladies and gentlemen, Kyle Stevens from Kirby Crackle. Woo! And last but certainly not least, I would like to introduce Christian, Jess, and Holly from the PDX Broadsides, a local uh, uh, So, uh, these folks have all come on my show and shared with me their top 10 favorite nerd tracks. Of, uh, regardless of genres, um, they all shared a, a blend of hip-hop, rock, folk, um, just good old classic guitar singer, songwriter stuff. and. Uh, one of the really interesting things that they all expressed to me individually, without talking about it ahead of time, is that they all feel like musicians who just make stuff, who make music about stuff they love, and the stuff they love just happens to be nerdy. And so um, I want to have kind of a bigger discussion this afternoon, but I wanted to start there, and I wanted to sort of address that concept, maybe starting with Angela here, and, and I wanted to sort of flesh that out a little bit, get a better idea of what the difference is between nerd music and music that's nerdy? That's a great question. Um, Ready to go. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it, I, I mean, I agree with what you said when you reiterated what we all said, which was, um, yeah, so, so we, we make music you, you said that, it. Yeah, that is nerdy. So, so the, the label nerd music or nerd folk or nerd rock or nerd core is very helpful for people who are nerds who want to hear songs about things that are nerdy to find us. But when I sit down to write a song, I'm not like, I'm gonna write a nerd song right now. Like, I really need to write a song about Pathfinder Adventure Card Game or something like that because I like that. We, we all, I think, would agree that a song isn't that interesting unless it has like feelings or jokes that are actually meaningful or funny or both. Uh, so it's less about just, I'm gonna write a song that says dice in it, which makes the song good and you can write that with several things. But if, uh, if it actually has more emotion which is why it's always weird to be on a nerd music panel, because it's like, that's not what I call it, but that's a very helpful label for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, if, if you have anything to add, um, if not, feel free to ask. I, I once heard somebody uh, talking about genre labeling 
and saying that the only thing that genre labeling was useful for was for uh, people who own uh, record stores and journalists. Um, other than that, fans don't care what the subgenre is, and so it's useful if you want to find where it is in like a section of a bunch of stuff, but really, if you just like the music you like. And uh, I think the thing that a lot of the nerd musicians, including the ones on this panel, do is they take nerdy subjects and they take it very seriously. Um, you, you can find like real emotional weight, or you can find something that's important in it. You're not just making the song funny because you happen to be rapping or singing about uh, Jane Austen or, you know, uh, Mario, Super Mario Kart. Um, there's, there's actual real meaning in that, and it's because those things have real meaning to us, even though there's a lot of people who would say, it's really stupid that you care that much about uh, Cajun seasoning. <laughs> so, but it, but no one would dare say <laughs> But it's important. And so the fact that it just happens to be about nerdy stuff doesn't mean that's any less important. I actually get very offended when people talk about how songs are silly because they're about silly things. And like, no one should tell you what's important to you. If, it's, if you find meaning and emotional weight in something, who cares if it's literature or whatever? I once, one of my best friends once said, uh, she was like, I've gotten more out of Avatar The Last Airbender than any book I have ever read in my life. I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, take down books, guys. <laughs> but uh, but I, I, I totally agree with that. I, I think that's a totally valid thing to say, just because it's not the Dostoevsky or whatever. It doesn't mean that some, somebody should be snobby and you know be above you about what they like. Yeah. Uh, really quick, uh, book. Don't worry about it. Sorry. Um, just to slightly expand on these guys, I felt put very well. Um, well, first off, how cool is it this panel gets bigger every year? That's awesome. Um, yeah. Someone's doing something right up here. We get to start doing this together. Uh, but, you know, if you look how nerd music, let's just call it that, uh, has evolved over the past four years, you could say, all right, how do you do it? I write a song about a superhero. I write a song about my favorite storyline. I think it's kind of changed over the years. To me, it used to be this song's about Spider-Man, but now it's like this song's about let's do math, and that's something uh, that I'm passionate about. I don't know. Um, so I think it's kind of evolved into whatever people are really passionate about. Like you know, no one's delivered a rap about Parks and Rec oh, with more emotion than this guy here. <laughs> that's like a false qualifier, though. That's right. Don't do it. <laughs> um, I wanted to interject real quick. Uh, uh, except I forgot what it was. <laughs> Super professional. Which of us begged to be up here, and which of us got asked? Right. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, uh, I want. I do want to hear from the PDX broadsides, but um, one of the things that uh, Kyle and I had discussed actually off air that I thought was really fascinating. Um, was that uh, Kirby Cracklin started to produce a lot more singles for the band camp in an effort to keep up with uh, what he described as the conversation. Uh, they did a song about Spider-Man when the Spider-Man movie was out, and, but then it didn't appear on the album until, what, almost a year later? And uh, I thought that was a really fascinating uh, perspective from an artist's standpoint to, to be concerned about the stuff that you're writing and how relevant it is in popular culture at the time when you publish it. And so, um, uh, for the broad size, I, I, I'd love to hear your answer to the first question, but, but in addition, uh, how do all of you guys feel about uh, the way music, the music that you make, uh, connects with your audience and how relevant it is to either, either a very narrow, focused conversation like Spider-Man, or a larger, grander conversation like going to Grandma's house, or just math? <laughs> I think there's a lot, there's a... a a couple of different levels that you can talk about with that. You can write a song that is about Spider-Man, but you can also write a song that is about shouldering responsibility. There, there can be a message within that song, and that's what I think that uh, a lot of us are, are kind of working towards is, you know, we write about the stuff that we like. We write about math, or we write about Doctor Who, or, or whatever, but beneath that, there's a reason why we're passionate about those things, and that's the message that we're getting across. I, for me, it, I don't care if you're passionate about 
uh, science or grammar or cats. As long as you're passionate about something, that makes you a geek. That makes you part of our conversation and uh, we become part of yours. Uh, there is a great, I'm a scientist, I think in science terms. Woo! Go science! Uh, <laughs> Now he's my best friend too, actually. Uh, so archive is a thing that biologists and phys uh, physicists use in order to have real-time sort of publications uh, out there. Like it's not necessarily peer-reviewed, but your peers can see what's going on and add it to their own research. So being able to do singles, uh, Kyle's got the right idea. Like being able to be an active part of that conversation when it's happening. Uh, it's the same in science. I'm glad to see it finally hitting music. We got it. No. <laughs> <laughs> and there, there is always the, the, the risk that you're going to write a song that's, that's very topical, or, or that's about something that's very topical, and then mm -hmm. that thing is going to go away out of the public memory before you get it out there. And then we got, we got hired for a Doctor Who gig, and, then, and we had no Doctor Who song. We were like, we're going to perform anyway! And then four days later, we wrote like four songs. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes we're a little late. And then they had that Fiscal Cliff song that never got out. I wrote a song about the Fiscal Cliff, and they won't let me perform it. Nobody and remembers what that is. But you know what? Sometimes your bandmates are right. And they say, look, that's not going to be relevant in about 30 seconds. <laughs> Come see me later. I'll say it for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, on that, and also your question, I, uh, is it, uh, how many people here are creators of music or interested in being creators of a sort of your music? Oh, Excellent. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because what you were saying and what Kyle was talking about with like releasing content is sort of a business model question. Like, and I think I want to have Adam talk about that because how many uh, songs did you release last year? <laughs> it's around like 100 songs. 114 songs. Something like that. Yeah, and you, can you talk about like your web comics model? Oh, yeah. Because I think it's amazing. So, uh, when I started doing comics, wow, when I started doing <laughs> song, songs, uh, I was doing a lot of stuff. I had a lot of friends who did web comics. I was really into web comics. I knew a lot of people that were bloggers, that were podcasters. And basically, the way it works with web comics, which I don't know why I'm explaining it to you, but I'm going to, is that they release like a comic for free, either like like every week or Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or like you know people like Scott Kurtz or whatever every day, and then once in a while they got so it's all free, and then once in a while they gather up all these uh, comics and then they bind it in a book, they put little extras in it, and then people will buy that book because even though they've already read it for free. Even already, even though they can always go to the archive for free, they know that you have to, to financially support this artist that's been giving you hours and hours of enjoyment from your computer. And so um, I wanted to do that with music, where basically what I did was every week I would release like one or two songs for free uh, as often as I wanted to. Some weeks I did like five when I was when I was bored, <laughs> had a lot less touring to do, and uh, once in a while I release an album like every two years or something, and then every year I do a donation drive where I still release a lot of music during it and everybody gets rewards if you donate anything from a cent to $100. In fact, if you donate a cent, which people do do, um, you are actually causing PayPal to lose money, so bravo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, and I get none of it. So, um, for the past couple of years, the donation drive is a kind of a, a call for people to say, like, if you want this machine to keep pumping out like enjoyable music cogs, you have to pay for the maintenance and the oil that goes into that machine. And it's been like a major way that I make a living because people just donate because they understand that this is a site that's been giving them a lot of music and um, and they should, you know, maybe toss like five bucks and you get all this free music and rewards in the process too. So um, I think web comics is probably like I hate music industry models. I hate the music industry <laughs> and like people who abide by like really traditional mindsets about how albums should be and how release schedule should be and like, promo and stuff like that. I think that people are smart enough to know that you can give away your album for free, which I do. I every year during my donation drive, I set all my for sale albums to completely free for a whole week. I say take it. I don't care if you donate or whatever. Um, and people still buy the albums during the year. People buy the albums multiple times sometimes, and it's really strange. Um, I get emails during the year of people going, can I give you money? And I say, no! Wait till June. When the <laughs> I literally do, I, I say no. I say just keep it until June, and then give it to me. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, <laughs> so people and fans are smart enough because I think, especially with nerds and geeks, they're, they are aware, time and time again, sequels, TV, TV series, comic books, things will go away if you don't support it. And it's, been, it's happened so many times, there's only so many times that you can bring back a Serenity or a Futurama before everything just kind of goes away and you never get to experience that ever again when these people put so much time and effort into this thing. So they kind of understand that and they kind of back it up with their wallet a lot of times, which is really great. And I'll tell you this, as somebody who runs in a lot of like indie hip hop circles, it's so funny when we do shows with like indie hip hop, like people who are actively bigger than us, and indie hip hop kids do not buy merch at all. They're just like, whatever, and they just drink their PBR or whatever. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, while all the geeks and the nerds are actively like buying merch and like giving us hugs and kind of being actively part of the community that we have. So it's a lot better to be a nerd than it is to just be uh, a, a, a scene stir stop. <laughs> Totally right. I think part of the part of the thing that makes the nerd music genre so cool is it's a conversation that's always happening, you know. And and I was thinking today on the way here how different it is that we all kind of start at the same time, but how everyone's you know career kind of broke off in different ways. You know, Angela and Double Clicks had their wildly successful Kickstarter thing, um, and that was awesome. And Adam has his June Drive, and for us we chose to do like a Patreon Kirby Crackle music thing. So it's interesting how everyone kind of finds their own way, and everyone is encouraging, I think, all of us to, to do that. I mean, I just got back from the Orlando Nerd Fest. Anyone go to that? No? Okay. You know like, when people die, and they come back, and they say, I saw something, but I can't tell you what it is? Okay, I'm going to tell you what I saw. So, long story short, there's like 56 bands. Uh, nerdcore groups, filled groups, uh, kind of just stage theatrical stuff, nerdcore rappers. And it was just people like us who were there, and the uh, stage ran two stages across a big room. And someone went on at nine, the other person set up. Then the person at 10 went up, then the other person set up. And it was like Lollapalooza in a perfect world of nerd music. So I encourage you to save your nickels and dimes to go next year if you can, because it was so cool and what I dream about existing on a large scale for what we're talking about now. Orlando Nerd Music Fest. Orlando Nerd Music Fest. Yeah, uh, I wanted to go so bad. And it's, I've watched so, um, Nerd, Nerd Palooza, Orlando Nerd Music Fest. Um, the folks that were putting these shows on over on the East Coast, um, they've got a really, really good support system from a lot of really, really good nerd acts from the East Coast. Uh, guys like uh, MC Frontlock, uh, guys like Shape of the Dark Lord, guy, uh, bands, um, I Fight Dragons, I think is from there. Uh, Alan Hanamaguchi is from New York, I, I believe, now. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, it's, it, what's really kind of fascinating to me, and what really kind of captured my attention, see, I, I'm a professional turntablist. I work in bars and clubs. Um, it would not be that weird for you to go pay $30 cover to get, one of, get in one of those really swanky, neon-y clubs downtown Portland and see me spinning behind the turntables. Because that's what I do for a living. I hate it. That's not fair. I don't enjoy it nearly as much as, say, next month when I'll be DJing at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo. Yeah. <laughs> because that's the one show that I do every year to keep my sanity when I'm playing, um, well, I won't name artists, but I think you guys know who I'm talking about. The, the big top 40 radio artists that I get so bored with playing week in, week out. And so discovering these guys uh, and just discovering their music, every single one of these guys has um, really recaptured my imagination even as a professional DJ, I enjoy music again because of these folks. And so um, that's a part of the reason why I started Radio for Your Court, and that's a part of the reason why I wanted to have this discussion, uh, because that happened for me when I found their music and connected with them on, on this whole other nerd level. And so uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to actually open up a question. Sure. When did you, when did you guys start Double Quicks? 2010. 2010? Yeah. When did you start Career Couple? 2009. 2009? Starting 2009. What happened that year? That, that year period. <laughs> you guys, when did you guys start? 2011. 2011. Mm -hmm. All right. I just was curious. <laughs> when did you start? 2009. But I started doing Avalon full time in 20 in 2010. 
I think the current class of great musicians started in 2009, 2010, and we're enjoying that class right now. Um, that's, that's my take. There, there was de definitely like a first wave, guys like Frontalot, Schaefer, uh, NC Large that were around, NC Chris that were around early. Yeah. John and Colton. No, we're right Colton. Now. <laughs> How could I possibly forget John and Colton? You just throw me out now. Uh, uh, and, I, and I enjoyed, you know, I went, to, I went to PAX in 2010. I saw a lot of really good acts for the first time live. And uh, there were some, some acts that I really understood and some acts that I really didn't. And it took me a while to get it. Um, Fremont was one of those guys that everyone was like, oh, he's a genius. He's awesome. I saw his live show in 2010, in 2010 on the Seattle. I didn't get it. I was like, it changed my damn life. I was like, what is this? <laughs> well, see, that's the thing. I, I understood his stuff later when I went back and really paid attention. The guy is a genius. Trust me on this. If you don't get it at first, try again. I should also say um, the, the model that I did where I released, I mostly released music like at least once a week. A lot of it is uh, due to John and Colton. Absolutely. And uh, I often tell people that um, they're like, who's your biggest influence? Because I think it's going to be some rapper or whatever. My number one influence, like above all, by a mile, is John Colton. Because I heard his music, was listening to the thing a week, and when I heard him doing things the way he did it, I said, I want to do what he does, but, but rap. And so he is, like, by far, like, the biggest reason that I do what I do. Yeah. Uh, Angela, the double push did a similar thing with Pixar, right? Where you guys had a certain goal and started putting out every week? Or... We did weekly song. I mean, yeah, and that, that's the Colton thing, too. And uh, just shortly, I've just been talking about a lot. The things that he does that are amazing are he gives everything away for free and says, if you like me, you're going to pay me for my music, which is why we're not jerks with people, because then you wouldn't like us, and also because we might do a great deal because you're just like us. Um, and, and, and he sets deadlines and uses the internet, and everything is great. But if you love to. <laughs> oh no, that's fine. I'm working on weather. We got we got time, guys. We're good. Um, but I wanted. I, that's actually it's a really good thing. We stopped and, and kind of uh, hovered on that point because um, I've seen huge, huge comedians. George Carlin talked about how every year he would do a special and then throw out all the material and start over. Uh, Louis C.K. right now is doing exactly the same thing. He references George Carlin when he talks about how every year he does a special, puts it on his website for five bucks. You can download it on of Louis C.K.'s website. And then every year when he records that DVD or records that special, he is done with that material. He throws it all out and starts all over completely from completely fresh. And when these guys started doing that, that's what it kind of reminded me of was some of these just absolute genius comedians that had figured that out years ago. And here we have these fantastic mirror musicians that are doing the same thing. Do you guys find that in the writing and recording process, uh, Kyle and, and, and maybe the broadsides, do you guys find that Throwing, throwing the material out onto the website and then letting it go and, and moving on to write new stuff? Is that part of your process? Or do you guys have to continually learn songs over? Sometimes you just have to. Sometimes the ideas come so quickly that you want to just get them down. You want to like jot them down <coughs> and get them out in some sort of form. I mean, it's always going to evolve when you play live. Like The more you play songs, you, you're going to develop stuff. But sometimes you just have to get stuff out there, just get stuff down and move on to the next idea so you don't lose things. Um, that's kind of the way we do it. We find ways that, I'm sorry. Uh, we find things that uh, we can do that aren't uh, necessarily always uh, geek related. We're part of a group called Theme Music and we do covers and the both original and things that are already out there every week. Uh, this man's the king of it. He's like David Bowie's clone. It's crazy. Uh, no, look him up on, on the YouTubes. He's amazing. Uh, but we, we do things that inspire us, that, that keep us uh, up. And we don't necessarily use them when we perform, but they keep us kind of sharp and on our toes. It's something new to us, and then we throw it out, and we start with something that inspires us that we can share. Yeah. I always thought that the cruel joke of being a songwriter is that the stuff that you spend forever on, people are like, that's okay. <laughs> you know? And like, you know, people, fans come up to our table every year, and like, we have this Green Lantern song called Rain Capacity, and people say, it's like, that how long did it take you? It's like, well, that took 10 minutes, and I wish everything was like that. So I've tried that thing where, like, I have 10 minutes, let's see what amazing film doesn't happen. <laughs> um, but recently, you know, that's it's scary to just write something and put it out, but that's the great thing about the age we live in, right? It's like, you guys, our sounding board, and you guys let us know, you know, you're really into it, or really not into it, and I think all of us would prefer to know either way, right, what happens, that's part of the deal, but, uh, you know, Patreon, we started doing this thing where we put some 
uh, original songs out and then say, hey, I like the band The Wee Peaks a lot, or I like Fleetwood Mac, here's a cover. And I think that kind of gets the conversation going where you guys know more where we're coming from when we do put out the stuff that, that really responds well. Uh, quick question, what is Patreon? Uh, Patreon is kind of like a cousin to Kickstarter where you're basically keeping, like Adam was saying, keeping the engine going. So what we do basically is, you know, you say two bucks a month, you get a new Kirby Crackle single, we put all the money into making more records. So it's something to keep, you know, like Adam puts it perfectly. It takes a lot to be an independent artist and grind all the time, but the only difference between us and you guys, if you're thinking about doing this, is just doing it. That's the really great thing, right? there's no big, there's no big puzzle, it's just kind of hustling, and, and uh, what's that, the, the new thing going around where people talk about it's, it's the ratio of success where as long as you keep doing it, something will happen 10,000 hours, right? Yeah, yeah. 10,000 hours yeah. become an expert. Not just an Apple song. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's stole my budget. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's, it, it's funny that you bring that up uh, as, as a big part of this conversation, because I'm seeing that more and more, and I think that's one of the things that really connected me to uh, a lot of you guys' music, is like, people get really jaded Again, coming from a top 40 DJ's perspective, people get super jaded with like the gold-plated hummers and the diamond-encrusted swimming pools. We all have those though. <laughs> yeah, you guys, like when you guys are asking for two bucks or five bucks or 10 bucks for an album or whatever, like it's going into like producing more music and it's going into like shopping at Costco and like, or, or whatever it is you guys do to make sure that your life can function and you can continue to make more music. It's not, it's, it's, there's no problem with excess, there's no problem with ego, at least not on the top, the scale of these huge top 40 worldwide artists. These artists are making fantastic music, and in my opinion, a lot of it is as good or better than a lot of the stuff that's on the radio, it's like quality-wise, and I know that it's coming from a really, really genuine place. Well, I mean, it's, it's like a lot of artists here in Artist Alley, there's a lot of comic artists who work regularly or they do stuff for indie, like IDW or Care and folks like that, where they're not gonna sell a movie and make millions of dollars, they make enough money to make what is a livable wage every year, and they do it by writing or drawing or inking or coloring, and um, there's a lot of people whose names you'll never like really know as a household name, but they've been doing comics for like 20 years as their full-time job because they just work and they make, they make a good living doing it, where it's, they're never going to have gold-plated hummers. I love Very that. impractical. <laughs> Don't you guys love those that man, gold-plated hummers from the 90s? Um, yeah! But, uh, but yeah, like that's what a lot of artists do, and that's kind of where a lot of us fall into, I think. We're never going to be making like top 40 singles or whatever, but we'll, we'll do okay. <laughs> I hear those hummers, they solve the gas mileage problem by just making them all hybrids. Because that was the problem. Right? Yeah. We'll never have gold-plated hummers, but we would settle for diamond-encrusted rims. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you and your diamonds. Um, uh, I do want to do that. So that's, anyway, that's what I really love about these guys, and that's what I've, um, uh, that's what really kind of captured my imagination when I first started discovering nerd music and really got uh, involved with n not only the nerd music but also with the, with the musicians. And so I wanted to kind of hear from a few of you guys, and I'll take a hand if anybody has a question that they want to ask the panel um, just to kind of continue the conversation forward. Yes, you right there. Uh, this is a mic right behind you, too. Should I just line up? Yeah, there's a mic. Yeah, you were in part of this. Sure, yes. So, um... Being a young, aspiring artist, I mean, I've already started writing songs, and I've taken up like tenor saxophone, singing, and guitar. Uh, I know also that. in very sax. I'm right there with you. I play well, all the college. Yeah. Well, we need more very sax high school. You should come to it. Anyway. I'm a little bit past high school, but thank you. Yes, but um, but knowing that one day I'm gonna be where you guys are, um, and you guys keep saying like, yeah, we just keep producing all this music. Sometimes I feel a little bit too scared to produce the music that I want know that I write or that I want to perform and I was just wondering if you guys had any advice. Like scared to put it out there or scared? Yeah, to scared to put it, it, put so, it out there. And so we... It's scary. When you do something that's personal to you, that means a lot to you, there's no guarantee at all when you put it out there that anyone's going to like it at all. That, and that, that happens even for, well maybe not for top 40 artists because that's all right. But <laughs> tell me about it. <laughs> when you've got something for yourself and you give it to other people, you don't know what they're going to do with it. So yeah, it's it's scary, but it's so 
I don't know, it's so rewarding to just have something, a finished product that you made, that you were a part of, that that kind of makes it happen. No matter what. Yeah, it's so much more rewarding to have a thing that you like and that you put yourself 100% behind that everyone hates than something that you kind of faked it on that everyone loves. Like, then you have to play that and then it feels bad inside. <laughs> so it just if, if you're honest with yourself and you put it out and then also, if you're already working, that's fantastic. Just keep doing it. Feel free to like go ahead and finish songs. Listen to a lot of music. You're great. I love you. They yeah. will connect, and it will connect with somebody. There, yeah. there are people out there that will feel the same way that you do about I, the things that you do. I may give you advice that's kind of a contradiction to everything that everybody said. <laughs> <laughs> but what they said is true. Also, um, especially when you're younger and you're developing your music and your art or your craft, don't be precious about what you make. A lot of it is going to be stuff that you will never revisit. It's going to be years ago in your past. There might be some people that don't like it. There might be a lot of people that don't like it. It's really important to have public um, embarrassment and shame. That makes you better. That makes you want to do better. And if you hold on to this song that you think is the most amazing thing in the world and a lot of people don't like it, you're never going to grow as an artist. So a lot of artists have this problem where they are super precious about what they make and they will never bend to what other people or what anything else will, will push it towards. But you're gonna progress and you're gonna grow, and as long as you're not precious about it while you still make music that's meaningful to you, you can understand that like, that's a song you made yesterday. What are you gonna do today? What are you gonna do tomorrow? And forget about yesterday. And you'll keep growing and keep making better music because if you listen to all the stuff that we all made probably when we were your age, you would laugh. I guarantee you, because it's, and we probably don't think about it ever. And I think it, about it all the time. <laughs> so don't be precious about it, and when people give you criticism, you can disagree with them, and you can say, screw you, I don't agree with you at all, keep doing what you do, but like you have to be willing to let your thing change to what it becomes. Um, and a lot of artists have that problem, and it's really frustrating sometimes, because you see people with a lot of talent, they're like, I'm just going to keep making this you know, avant-garde, craft work, bleeps bloops, that has no rhythm. And it's like, well, you know, maybe you should change a little bit. So it's like both, meaningful to you, but also not precious about it to the point where you won't let yourself change and grow. Be open to criticism. I'll tell you the, the records I made in high school, we can laugh together. <laughs> but like what these guys said is, I had this period, like when I was your age, I would write these songs and I'd be, Oh, I'm never in a place for anyone. And I look back and I'm like, oh, it was a shame because the stuff I did led me to the next song, right? The next song, the next song. So I'm super excited to hear what you do. Thank you. Yeah. Two, two more follow up questions. Uh, first and foremost, how many banners in the audience? Ban bandies? Banners? Anybody? You can clap, you can make clap. Yeah, elbow, symbols. By a round of applause. How that is a low ratio. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, banner through and through. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, definitely keep going, Shadow. Um, but they, I, I, I have to tell you, there was, do you guys know who the Proto Men are? Yeah! Woo -woo. yeah. So, one of my absolute favorite bands in the entire realm of nerd music is the Proto Men. And if you're not familiar, it is a uh, rock opera based on Mega Man. <laughs> yes. I'll let that sink in for a second. <laughs> And they're fantastic. It's like a 13 or 14 piece band. They have a trumpet. They have a guy whose only job is to bang on the world's biggest bass drum. The biggest bass drum I've ever seen in my life. That's his one job. And it's incredible. Like, he gets techno level bass bumps out of an actual drum. Uh, the only electronics on stage are just the keyboards. Like, they do it all live, and it's incredible the sounds they get. And um, when I got a chance to meet them at PAX, uh, I had a very similar question. Um, because I really wanted to get involved in their music, and I really, I, I just got so hooked, and I felt so passionate about it. Um, and what they told me was that, uh, you know, uh, and this, this kind of stems from another, from another really famous quote. Basically, uh, basically, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Uh, you will never make a living as a musician if no one ever hears your music. And so you have to learn how to be comfortable with showing yourself to people, even if it's not as good as you want it to be. You would be surprised how much you can learn and grow and how much better you can become if you learn how to just show it to people and, and take people's criticism. There's a lot of really mean people out there on the internet. I'm not going to lie to you. 
But what? there is a ton. Yes, I know. We'll talk about it later, guys. Uh, I'll fill you in. Um, but, but there is a ton, a ton of really, really positive, really awesome people out there that are just like these folks who want to see more musicians succeed and want to see more people like you grow and, and, and grow to create awesome stuff. Um, and and uh, that quote, by the way, is, is an old Wayne Gretzky quote. He's one of the most famous hockey players, actually the most famous hockey player in the history of the game. You miss. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Uh, <laughs> Wayne, Wayne Gretzky said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And, and I think that that quote applies so vehemently to everything that these folks go through, uh, which makes them so much more impressive to me. Uh, yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi. So, um, I, uh, well, I'm not a musician. I'm a writer and storyteller by trade. Uh, I want to know, people who produce content as frequently as you folks do, how do you keep on task in this amazingly oversaturated media world of stuff to look at and do all the time? That is a great question, guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> li like, in the like abstracts, deadlines, and um, just learning what our process is and figuring out when I can work and when I can't, and fake deadlines. Practically, I have a thing on my computer that blocks Twitter and Facebook and uh, my email, and I put that on, and I'm like, I'm gonna only have my rhyming dictionary that has never helped me, but I look at it constantly. Um, yeah, it really is just like, oh yeah, I do that these things run with steam. Hooray, good work. Um, but, and then I just sit there and then I have somebody staring at me, or I, like, I know when my boyfriend gets home, I want to play the song for him. And then I know that I'm only going to come up with a good hook if I'm showering. Like, like the, the, just learning that process. Oh, and, letter, yeah, literally taking things away from myself and pain. And it's not fun. But it, it becomes fun when it's done. Sometimes you'll be in the middle of doing a thing, and it's not necessarily about you know the newest and best thing that's happening, but I'll be at the, the bench working, and uh, I started to hum a song in my head, and I had to literally drop everything and run into my office and write it. And I wrote a song about if you were running a help desk in purgatory. Um, so, and hey, come here or sing it tomorrow somewhere. Uh, and. Those are, are things like sometimes you just get inspired. And I know, like, you're a writer and a storyteller. Sometimes you'll see something and you'll say, I have to talk about that. I have to write about it. So take your inspiration when you can. And sometimes something else has to wait. Just don't put everything off. But also, while you're waiting for inspiration to come, don't forget to do regularly scheduled work. Time. You know, like schedule some time to sit down. Like Andrew was saying, like cut off Twitter, cut off Facebook, and, and, and actually just go through the motions. Even if you're just going through the motions and you don't have inspiration, do it because it gets you uh, in the practice of working it out. Just get the sucks. Yeah. What, oh, yeah the how do you work all the time? Uh, I just I work every day. It's a muscle. It's the exercise. And when you are creating something new, edit. Um, go back and look at the things that you left behind and try again um, and, and fix them or change them or um, jumble them up and, and put them in new order. But and at least keep yourself um, like creatively working. When, when I don't um, have like anything pressing to do, I try to make a song every day. And a lot of them are terrible, and a lot of them I don't release. So in addition to the like 550 songs I have on my website, I probably have about 200 more that I've never really done anything with. You're a crazy person. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was you know, a full-time musician. You, you have to figure out a schedule on every morning. I'm a morning person. I wake up really early, and then I just answer emails for like ever, because that's what being a musician is. It's answering a lot of emails. Like three sessions a day where you're like, oh, 50 emails piled up that I'll need a response about something. And then just writing and working every single day, even when it feels bad. It's interesting, I, I once heard a quote um, on a podcast from Chris Hardwick uh, telling uh, a younger comedian how to, um, how to do comedy full time. And he said, go and find an open mic, find a comedy, weekly comedy show, and host it. Don't perform at it, just host it. And if you don't know anything about stand-up comedy, like a host of a comedy night will come out and do like a little couple minutes and he'll kind of do like a little jokes in between the other acts. 
he's not really the focus of it, but he keeps the, the trains running on time. And he said, do it every week. Do it every weekend, even if you're depressed, even if you're sick, even if you don't want to do it. Because when you do your craft on the day when you 100% don't want to do it, that's when you're a professional at it. At it. And I always took it to heart when he said that. So. Yeah, Adam's secret is he never stops working. He's, yeah. he's working right now. You can't tell him. Well, Adam, uh, thank you. And uh, thank you for wearing the Lion Cat shirt. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, my first helped us a lot too. We we did a, a weekly open mic where we would we would try to do something. We tried to never repeat songs that we had done before, so we would do open mics all the time. And it and it gets you used to just going up and doing going up and performing. If you're not used to performing, then it's really good for you. And it's also good to try to write songs. And also performing in front of people who are not necessarily accustomed to the subjects that we are singing about. Yeah, we so like, who's a fan of Doctor Who? So if you can, yeah, if you can win a, over a crowd that's that's used to John Mayer singer songwriter kind of stuff, then you know that's a good sign. Uh, all right, who's next? Um, um uh, this this might be like um disruptive or something, but I was told on it. If if it is, I'll just come find find um, Adam and the booth. Um, but I was told in a certain podcast that if I mentioned Gravity Falls, that you would. <laughs> but there's I can't do it here. I'm sorry. I don't, I'm not set up for sound. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so I, can't, I can't do the Gravity yeah. Falls song. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Come find me in the booth, though. I'll give you something for free for knowing that very obscure thing I said. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everybody. So you are all now pigeonholed as nerd art or nerd music of whatever type. So I'm wondering about the pressure to deliver on your fans' expectations once they have them and when you want to write a song that isn't nerdy. That's a great question. We, we just, we've got one um, that's just kind of marginally nerdy. Story oh, yeah. story me. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's marginally, well, it's, it's in that it only marginally mentions uh, Xena. Mm -hmm. And being the better, better geekier yeah. human no being. But, um, but on top of that, the, the, the message is something that, that kind of strikes to the heart of, of nerd people everywhere. So I guess, you know, even if you're not mentioning pop cultural topics, you could still be talking about something that's universal. Um, I suppose there is there's a little pressure to, you know, to talk about the things. It's kind of the things that don't get sung about very often, and so you know, there's always the, the pressure to internally to, to talk about that stuff. I think when you're when you're new, there is that feeling like you want to you want to entertain and. And you, and you really have to try to ignore it. It's that feeling like, oh, you want to show that you belong and you know what you're talking about. Like, okay, we like all, yeah. Yeah, like, we all like all the things that you like, and we know about the things, and so we, we can all talk about this together. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I get lost. Like, we have the, um, like, fortunate thing about we are all three into things that, like, uh, I... I don't know. I, I don't. I sing songs that I don't even know what I'm talking about sometimes. <laughs> but we, because we have that, that we cross a lot of genres. Um, but it's it's hard sometimes when you're starting out because you want to be relevant, but you also don't want to like oversell yourself and try so hard that you forget what your original idea is and what your message is. <laughs> Yes, that's something that I struggle with all the time, actually. And for years before the nerd rock thing, I just did quote unquote regular rock or alternative rock or something. So on, on our records, what I try to do is put a couple of non-nerdy songs in there. So I always just kind of exercise that muscle. So if we do something about you know going to get burgers at Dick's Drive and people like, what? That's not about Deadpool. What? <laughs> so I try to build that in a little bit when I'm you know. People say write a Star Trek song. I think I can't. Angela can do that, and 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 only try to do kind of what you know. Uh, you're all about the Pearl Jam and the Soundgarden, right? Like, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, it's ten. I don't think there is not about tribbles. Maybe some very good. Listen, maybe. Listen closely. Listen closely. Oh, yeah. Subtext. Play it backwards. Um, I do a lot of music. Um, not a lot, but I've done a lot of songs about um, like psychological disorder, um, depression, like anxiety. Uh, I myself suffer from obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, I think those are tangentially enough related to uh, nerd problems because, or just people problems. A lot of being a nerd growing up, you feel very isolated, you feel very alone and ostracized. And a lot of times, um, you'll find I'll find that if I do a personal song or a song that has nothing to do with being a nerd, um, it won't get as many views. A lot of people probably may not even like it, but like one or two people will message me personally and tell me that it meant a lot to them. So like you have the balance between having a song about I don't know, Ron Swanson that gets a, all these views of people who are like passive listeners, you know, they'll listen to it and they'll be like, that was, that was cool, and then they never really think about it again. And you do a song that only like so many people listen to, but the people that listen to it, it really makes an impact on it. And it's the balance of the two that kind of make a whole of like what you hope to accomplish with whatever their music is, so. Also, if you have two bands, that sometimes helps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Five minutes. Hi. I'm uh, Eric. I'm feeling ridiculous and nervous to ask a question at a panel about nerd rock, but I'm going to try anyway. Um, sure, it's amazing. Oh, thank you. So, the creative process you come up with a song, you throw your idea down on paper, write some chords to it, and then next up, you try and record it down, filter it out, and then you mix it somehow to finish it off and polish it up. How often do you, in general, and feel free to answer this quickly, like write a quick mix and record down a, a scratch track or something and release it versus polishing up and trying to release that? All the time. <laughs> we just did that. We, we just uh, recorded, just put a, a mic up in, during a rehearsal and just went through, partially just so that we would have a recording of what the song was so we could remember and, and refer back to it and, and workshop and stuff, but also so that we could just put it out there so we could so faint to hear like what we were working on at the time and some of our newer stuff. We put it on Bandcamp, it's available. And, uh, so go to the pdxbrowns.bandcamp.com. Uh, but it's called Relaxed. Yeah. Hi, shameless. But uh, we, but it's it's rehearsal cuts. But you can hear what we're doing now and what we're thinking, and we can get feedback from you. And it's a little more immediate that way. Yeah. Sometimes it's something really experimental. I'll just do it on a little recorder and kind of put it for free on Bandcamp. But I try stuff that I, you know, put out for songs to buy. I want to make sure that I'm giving you some guys something that I would like in return that has value to me. I feel good about putting out. So that usually means I'm fully mixed and mastered. But Thank you very much. Uh, there's a uh, hip hop artist. Unfortunately, we're, we're running low on time, so I can take a few more questions. Uh, we got a plug. Do them really? Let's do them really fast. Okay, one more. We can shut up. Uh, they can talk. They're, they're here to watch. Go ahead. So, Kyle, you mentioned earlier that there was a song that you worked harder on, and then the five minute songs that you do really quick are ones that people really like. I'd like to know the ones that you guys really put your heart into uh, that you really love that. <laughs> <laughs> The, the ones that you really, really uh, appreciate, those are the ones I'd like to know uh, which ones those are for you guys. Well, for me, it was like the first song on our new record, Sounds Like You, Parachute. I just thought it was like a cool chord change and something that, that to me, kind of I got off on it, but people were kind of like, yeah, that's okay. I'm like, man. Eh. <laughs> I don't understand the chord changes. That's the way it works with the first song, right? I like our, I mean, I like our song, Wonder, and I just played it enough that people have to know it so that they have to like it. And, <laughs> um, um, and our, our song, like like Kyle was talking about, the Ring Capacity song, um, we have a song where the chorus is literally, we like got to it and I was like, all right, what's the song about? Okay, rah, rah, blah, that's it. Um, and if we didn't play that song, uh, eight-year-old children would murder me. Uh, but all, fortunately, it's a song that we like a great deal. But it's just like, some things will hit you like magic, and some things you start. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have a lot of depressing songs that we don't play because they're just sad about my childhood. But <laughs> I don't want to play those anyway. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thank you. Um. Uh, I can actually, I want to address both of the last two questions in my shameless plug. 
Um, so, uh, Adam Moore, I came on my podcast show, Radio Free Nerd Corp, which can be found at dangerouskid.net or on Stitcher. Uh, we're building a brand new website this week, uh, so if you go there right now, it's just a landing page, but you can listen to Adam's show, because uh, I, I threw it up on SoundCloud, so it's free to download. Um, but when he came on the show, he sent me an email with his list of his top ten favorite nerd songs. And one of them was from a guy named Whitey Cracker, who has been doing nerd hip-hop for quite a while. I, I would consider him one of the first wave guys that came up with front of a lot and Schaefer and those guys. Yeah, he's like a 90s dude. Yeah, Whitey, Whitey Cracker's been around for quite a while. And uh, when, when Adam sent me his list, he linked a YouTube video to a very specific version of a Whitey Cracker song. And apparently it was like a version that had a different beat. It was the same song, but it had a different beat, and it was a rough cut that they threw up on YouTube and didn't actually make it to the their the album and then uh, like I, I went digging through his whole catalog on his band and couldn't find it anywhere except for just the one album version that Adam was like no not that one <laughs> this one off of YouTube so I had to figure out how to record off of YouTube <laughs> just to get it on the show um, but uh, ask any twelve year old they know how to <laughs> <laughs> I don't know any twelve year olds I just ask YouTube but that's uh, that. I thought that was interesting. The last two questions specifically, sort of, sort of uh, uh, deal with that because I, I thought it was really interesting that that here I run a podcast where I literally ask all these folks to share their top ten favorite tracks. Um, that some of them they they were on their own tracks, some of them not. Um, interestingly, you can name our own tracks. <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, Angela came on and did a track that they did with Molly Lewis um, that was about a, beers. That was a Molly Lewis song. That it was a Molly Lewis song, but she was on it. I purposely um, left myself off. So I, it would have been on me. I, I tried to. Do, I tried to. Do, <laughs> it fell on me in one in one double place in Kirby Brackett's song. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. I, I try to do as many shows as I can where I try to share really cool music. Like one of the shows I'm planning, I'm going to be sharing a cover that Angela did with a guy named Professor Shy Guy recently. And it's a cover of a song from Dr. Horrible, and it's fantastic. And they shot the whole thing in like a lunchroom in a con somewhere. <laughs> and so um, uh, that's the kind of thing that I really want to bring to people with the show. So uh, DangerousKids.net is the website. Radio for your course the show. Uh, websites and plugs go. We love you. Google us. If you have any more questions, come see us afterwards. I'm the double list. I'm Adam Warlock. I'm not here tomorrow, so if you want to see me, you guys see me today. <laughs> so, uh, Arlo. Um, Kirby Crackle playing the costume contest tonight with the full band right afterwards at the booth all weekend and acoustic panel tomorrow. Thanks for being here, guys. We have PDX Broadsides. We're at PDX, uh, PDX Broadsides on Twitter and Facebook, uh, the pdxbroadsides.bandcap.com. And we are being performing tomorrow out in the hall and at various booths uh, in a ninja style uh, tomorrow. And on the streetcar next week. And on the streetcar next week. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys very much.